Shalom and welcome back to Israel with Aline. Today, when we talk about Iran, many people immediately think of the Islamic Republic, Ayatollahs, missile attacks on Israel, and conflict. However, did you know there's a strong connection between Iran and the Bible? In fact, parts of the Bible were written in what is now Iran. Today, we'll explore archaeological findings that affirm this connection, revealing Iran's ties to the fulfillment of biblical prophecies, past, present, and especially future. So if you're ready, let's begin. Iran is referenced over 240 times in the Bible, though not by its current name. The name Iran only started being used in 1935. In biblical times, this region was known primarily as Persia, encompassing various peoples such as the Elamites, Parthians, and Medes. From here on, we'll use the biblical term Persia. Though Persia is 2,000 kilometers from Israel, it played a crucial role in fulfilling God's word. Now let's move a bit closer to home. Here behind me, we see the city of Jerusalem. We're less than four kilometers from the old city, which in biblical times was magnificent, with palaces, gardens, grand walls, gates, and of course Solomon's temple, where the Ark of the Covenant resided. However, in 586 BCE, the Babylonians completely destroyed the city. They also demolished Solomon's temple, killed many, and took much of the population into exile in Babylon. Among these exiles was Daniel. Little did people know then that this young man, forcibly taken into exile, would become one of the greatest prophets of the Bible. Living in a foreign land must have been challenging for Daniel and the others. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept, remembering Zion. On the willows, we hung our harps, as the psalmist wrote, lamenting their captivity. Their captors even demanded they sing songs of Zion, yet they asked, How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? It must have been confusing, as God had promised the land of Israel to the people of Israel, but now they were far from it, in exile. God repeatedly made this promise in the Bible. Here are some examples. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land I will show you. Stay here, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands and confirm the oath I made to Abraham, your father. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars of the sky and give them all these lands. Through your descendants all nations on earth will be blessed. In another verse it is written, Here is the land I am giving you. Enter and possess the land the Lord swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants after them. There are many such verses, and if you'd like, you can pause the video to read those on the screen. It's intriguing. God called Abraham from his homeland, from Mesopotamia, and sent him to Canaan, promising it to him and his descendants. Yet in Daniel's time, during the Babylonian exile, God sent his people away from this land to a foreign one. Something here seemed not to make sense. But Daniel had unwavering faith in God and in the Scriptures. He knew the exile would end and that Persia itself would be the agent of Israel's deliverance. The prophet Jeremiah even mentioned that the exile would last only 70 years. But how could this happen when Babylon seemed unbeatable with its vast empire and clear policy of exile? Shalom and welcome back to Israel with Aline. Nowadays, when people think of Iran, the first images that come to mind often include the Islamic Republic, the Ayatollahs, missile attacks on Israel, and conflict. But did you know that there is a significant connection between Iran and the Bible? In fact, parts of the Bible were written in what we now know as Iran. Today, we'll explore archaeological sites that verify this link, demonstrating Iran's connection to the fulfillment of biblical prophecies, not only in the past and present, but also in the future. So, if you're ready, let's get started. Iran is mentioned over 240 times in the Bible, 
though not by this modern name. The term Iran only came into use in 1935. In biblical times, the region was primarily known as Persia, home to various peoples such as the Elamites, Parthians, and Medes. From now on, we'll refer to it by its biblical name, Persia. Although Persia was about 2,000 kilometers from Israel, it played a crucial role in fulfilling God's word. But let's begin closer to home. Here in the background, we see Jerusalem, only about four kilometers from the old city. In biblical times, Jerusalem was a magnificent city with palaces, gardens, grand walls and gates, and of course Solomon's temple, which housed the Ark of the Covenant. However, in 586 BCE, the Babylonians completely destroyed the city, including Solomon's temple. They killed many people and took a large part of the population into exile in Babylon, among them Daniel. One can only imagine how difficult it must have been for Daniel and the others to live in exile in a foreign land. By the rivers of Babylon we sat down and wept as we remembered Zion. On the willows nearby we hung our harps, the Psalms tell us. Those who took them captive demanded songs and expected them to be joyful, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. But how could they sing the Lord's song in a strange land? It must have been confusing because God had promised the land of Israel to his people, yet they were far from it. This promise is repeated throughout the Bible, as seen in verses like, The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land I will show you. Stay in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands, and will confirm the oath I swore to Abraham your father. Another verse states, See, I have given you this land. Go in and take possession of the land the Lord swore he would give to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants after them. Despite being far from their homeland, Daniel had complete faith in God and his word and believed that the exile would end. It was Persia that would ultimately deliver the Israelites, as the prophet Jeremiah had foretold the exile would last seventy years. But how would this happen? The Babylonians seemed invincible, with a powerful empire that strictly enforced exile policies. They exiled not only Jerusalem and Israel, but other peoples as well, forbidding them from returning home or rebuilding their temples. So how could the Israelites return to their land and rebuild the temple in Jerusalem? The answer is also in the Bible, in Isaiah 45. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before him, to strip kings of their armor, and to open doors that cannot be shut. I will go before you and will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. I will give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by name. For the sake of Jacob my servant, of Israel my chosen, I summon you by name and bestow on you a title of honor, though you do not acknowledge me. Cyrus unified the peoples of Persia, creating a vast empire that defeated the Babylonians, taking over their lands, including Babylon and Israel. Through Cyrus, the prophecies of Daniel, Isaiah, and Jeremiah were fulfilled, and the people were finally able to return to their homeland. In this way, Cyrus changed biblical history, shaping the destiny of Israel and helping to fulfill many prophecies. Remarkably, when Isaiah wrote about Cyrus, it was 150 years before Cyrus's birth, and he calls him anointed. This is one of the highest titles given to a person in the Bible, and Cyrus is the only non-Israelite who receives it. Cyrus was indeed a monumental figure in biblical history. Cyrus made Israel a Persian province, with the center of Persian administration in this region located right here, where we can see the remains of this historical site.
Let's now take a look at the headquarters of the Persian Empire here in Israel during biblical times. We are currently at Kibbutz Ma'ale HaHamisha, established in 1926. Its founders had no idea that there were ancient ruins here. They simply liked this hill and its proximity to Jerusalem. But soon after beginning construction, they noticed something intriguing on the ground. Everywhere you look, there are fragments of ancient pottery. These ceramic pieces, thousands of years old, suggest a significant site here. But the true significance of this place wasn't discovered until the 1950s, when they were building a new water tower nearby. As they dug, they found stone formations resembling walls and other structures, so they brought in archaeologists. What they found was not just a small building, but colossal structures fit for royalty, dating back over 2,700 years. This was originally the summer palace of the kings of Judah, built with the finest craftsmanship of its time. When Cyrus took over this region, he repurposed the palace, expanding it to become the Persian administrative center in Israel. Among the artifacts discovered from the Persian period were numerous pieces of Persian pottery and large storage facilities with grain, wine, and oil reserves. This excess of resources was likely due to the tax system of the time in which people from Jerusalem and surrounding cities paid tribute in goods, often non-perishable items, since currency wasn't widely used. Many of the clay seals found here have Hebrew and Aramaic inscriptions, indicating the Persian Empire's impact on this land. Remarkably, 270 jar handles were found, with inscriptions of Judah and Jerusalem. The Persian period brought prosperity to Israel, with the rebuilding of Jerusalem, the return of temple utensils, and, most importantly, the fulfillment of God's word through Cyrus. During this same Persian era, the Book of Esther was also written, set in the Persian city of Susa, and tells the story of Esther and King Ahasuerus. Though the Persian Empire fell to the Greeks 200 years later, the connection between Persia and Israel did not end, but grew stronger. We see evidence of this in the birth of Jesus, who was visited by the Magi, or Persian wise men, who followed a star from the east to pay homage to him. And in Acts, after Jesus' ascension, the disciples gathered, and on Pentecost they were filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in various languages as the Spirit enabled them. As the Spirit enabled them to speak, devout Jewish men from every nation under heaven were residing in Jerusalem. When that sound was heard, a crowd gathered, perplexed because each person heard them speaking in their own language. Astonished and amazed, they said, Look, aren't all these people speaking Galileans? How is it then that each of us hears them in our native tongue? Present were Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya near Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts, Cretans and Arabs. Amazed and perplexed, they asked each other, What does this mean? Among these groups, witnessing the descent of the Holy Spirit and the speaking in tongues, were the first three mentioned, the Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, the peoples of Persia, what is now Iran. They were a blend of Jews living in these regions, along with converts and Gentiles who believed in the one true God. Many of these received the Holy Spirit that day and were converted. Isn't it remarkable? Among the first to recognize and worship Jesus were Persian Magi, and among the first to receive the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem were the three peoples of Persia. We've discussed Persia's glorious past, but what of its present and future? In 1979, the Islamic Revolution overthrew the Persian imperial state, establishing the Islamic Republic of Iran and a radical Muslim theocracy. Religious minorities face persecution in this regime, with 166 Christians imprisoned last year alone for their faith. Bible distribution is strictly forbidden, conversion to Christianity is illegal. And even praying or holding Christian services in Persian, Iran's primary language today, 
is prohibited. Other religious minorities, including Jews, Zoroastrians, Yazidis and Baha'is, also face oppression. It's astonishing to think that 2,500 years ago, Cyrus granted religious freedom to everyone within the Persian Empire. Yet in 2024, the Iranian people have fewer religious rights than they did then. This same Islamic Republic has also become the largest state sponsor of terrorism worldwide, funding groups such as the Houthis in Yemen, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Hamas and Islamic Jihad in Gaza and Kata'ib Hezbollah in Iraq, as well as the Quds Force, among others. This is the harsh reality in Iran today. Perhaps the biggest question is, what does the Bible say about Iran's future? There is a prophecy concerning Elam. Located in the southwest of Iran, one of the peoples present at the descent of the Holy Spirit. In Jeremiah, we read the word of the Lord that came to the prophet Jeremiah about Elam at the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah. This is what the Lord Almighty says, I will break the bow of Elam, the mainstay of their might. I will bring upon Elam the four winds from the four corners of heaven, and I will scatter them to the four winds, and there will not be a nation where Elam's exiles do not go. I will terrify Elam before their foes, before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster on them, my fierce anger, declares the Lord. I will pursue them with the sword until I have made an end of them. I will set my throne in Elam and destroy her king and officials, declares the Lord. Yet I will restore the fortunes of Elam in the last days, says the Lord. This prophecy speaks of great destruction, but also promises that in the last days Elam will be restored, implying the restoration of at least part of what is today Iran. Now I ask you, what do you think the Bible means with this destruction and restoration? Share your thoughts in the comments on what this prophecy may truly reveal. I invite you all to pray for the Iranian people, for their freedom and for peace. I hope you've enjoyed learning more about Persia's past, Iran's present, and what biblical prophecies might say about the future of this entire region. Much love, and I'll see you next time.